In today's lesson, we're going to look at the inverse and the contrapositive of conditional statements. The inverse is a statement that is formed by negating both the hypothesis and the conclusion of a conditional statement. For example, if a number is even, then it is divisible by 2. The inverse is if a number is not even, then it is not divisible by 2. The contrapositive a statement that is formed by negating both the hypothesis and the conclusion of the converse of a conditional statement. For example, if a number is even, then it's divisible by 2. The contrapositive would be, if a number is not divisible by 2, then it is not even. So, just short form, we negate the inverse, we negate and switch. The contrapositive. What students often end up making a mistake on is, is that they know that the inverse is negate and then they switch the inverse, which is great, but sometimes you forget that what you're doing is you're actually switching the conditional statement and negating that. So we can sometimes get things a little bit mixed up. So always go back to your conditional to make sure you did the right switch. Let's take a look at the first example. It says, if today is February 29th, then this year is a leap year. Now, we have to look at what year we're in right now to verify the statement. So what is P? Our hypotheses. The first part of our conditional statement. If today is February 29th. Q, this year is a leap year. Okay, so if today is February 29th, we assume that's true. This year is a leap year. Now this is true because the only time that we have a leap year is if there is February 29th. Otherwise, February has 28 days. So if that's true and that's true, P is true and Q is true, then P implies Q is also true. So that means our conditional statement is true. Now the next part of this question says verify the inverse or disprove it with a counterexample. This symbol in front of the P and in front of the Q, that's in logic, it says the inverse of P then Q is written if not P then not Q. So that is the negation symbol. Okay. So let's write our inverse statement first. So if we're Looking at my conditional statement, it says if today is February 29th, then this year is a leap year. To negate it, if today is not February 29th, then this year is not a leap year. So let's do the truth table. So we assume true, right, if today is not February 29th. So what's the date today? You look at the date, okay. If it's not February 29th, which today is not February 29th, then it is not a leap year. Well, this is false. In my case, I'm looking at today's date, and today is September 14th, 2016. Well, a leap year occurs every four years, right? And this could still be September 12th, 2000, sorry, September 14th, 2016, could still be a leap year. So this would be a false statement. So not P implies not Q. Our inverse is a false statement. If we want to look at this counterexample, right, that would be the same idea. So September 14th, 2016, still a leap year. Now, the question is, how many counterexamples do you need? 
You only need one. As long as you can find one counterexample, then you're done. Then you know that the statement is false. Okay? And the counterexample proves that the inverse is false. Let's take a look at the next page. It says verify the contrapositive or disprove it with a counterexample. So remember that when we're writing the contrapositive, we flip and negate the conditional, or if you've already done the converse, you can just negate the converse, or if you've already done the inverse, then you flip the inverse. Either way, you should get, if this year is not a leap year, then today is not February 29th. Okay, so you can see that Q is first, P is second in my truth table, so we assume true, if the year, this year is not a leap year, then today is not February 29th. That has to be true, because the only way we get February 29th is on a leap year. So true, true, not P implies, I mean, not Q implies not P, so that's also true. So since both the hypothesis and the conclusion is true, the contrapositive is also true. Okay, let's take a look at example two. It says, consider the following conditional statement. If a number is a multiple of 10, then it is a multiple of 5. Now, we should write the contrapositive for the statement for A, and then verify that the conditional and contrapositive statements are both true. You can use this method 1 using reasoning, or you can do this using method 2, which is using a Venn diagram. Personally, I prefer the Venn diagram, but either way is sufficient. So let's look at method one. So first of all, A, write the contrapositive for the statement, and method one, method two would be the same. So go ahead and do that. If a number is not a multiple of five, then it is not a multiple of 10. Now let's use reasoning. So we're going to set up our truth tables for both the conditional statement and the contrapositive statement. Okay, so let's look at the conditional statement. If a number is a multiple of 10, that's my hypothesis if we look up here. If a number is a multiple of 10, true. Okay, let me assume that's true then it is multiple of 5. So think of your multiples of 10. Are all those multiples of 10 a multiple of 5? Yes, they are. So that's true. So then the conditional statement is true. Okay, now if we look at the contrapositive statement, if a number is not a multiple of 5, so think of a number that's not a multiple of 5. Okay. Let's say it's 3. You can do uh, 11. You could do 27. Right? Those are all numbers that are not multiples of 10. Is it also not a multiple of 5? Yeah, that's true. So both the conditional and the contrapositive are both true. Okay, so that's one method. Let's look at it with a Venn diagram. So I'm not going to do A again, because A is the same thing. You're just rewriting the contrapositive, but B would change. So I'm going to set up my Venn diagram by defining my variables. We'll use I, F, and T. I is the set of integers. F are multiples of 5.
and t are multiples of 10. Okay, so when we look at this, I've got i out here, right? And what would be a subset of the other? Well, your multiples of 5, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, also include your multiples of 10. And what would go on the outside? That would be f prime, right? Or f complement, I should say. Right? All of our values that are not multiples of 5 and not multiples of 10. So when we're looking at b, right, for the conditional statement, well, just write that. For the conditional statement, if t, our multiples of 10, are a subset of f, our multiples of 5, that means the conditional is true. But for a contrapositive, let's see, well, f complement, those are any, any non-multiples of 5, right? Well, all of our non-multiples of 5, that means that t is not a subset of the complement of f. Therefore, the contrapositive is also true. So you can see regardless of whether you use the second method or the first method, the outcome is going to be the same. Okay, you're going to end up with the same outcome either way. So there's one more example here. Example three. Okay, I'd like you to try that one on your own. Let's have a look at it together for a moment. This is dealing with colors. So it says Arizona is studying the color wheel in art class. She observes the following. If the color is red, yellow, or blue, then it's a primary color. So I'm going to ask you to write the converse, write the inverse, verify that the converse and the inverse are both true, and then have a look and see if the statement is biconditional. Okay? And we'll go over this together in class. If you want to check your answer before class, you can always go and have a look in our math notebook on the class website. Thanks for joining me today.